Well, good morning, church family. It's good to be with you today. Um, I'm excited for the passage of scripture that we're gonna open up here in just a few minutes, but I wanna, get, I wanna see if you relate to me in this. When I say the word wait, we don't like that word, do we, in our culture at all. In fact, I, I was looking at some stats today. Did you know 96% of Americans, I don't know how they know this, but this, I like this. 96% of Americans knowingly consume extremely hot food or drink that they know is going to burn them. 63% of those will do it repeatedly because they don't want to wait. More than 50% of people will hang up after being on hold for less than one minute. Now, here's one that's, here's an incredible one for you. The number of people who will binge watch at least seven episodes of a TV show at one time because, and here's why they do it. They don't want to wait for each episode to come out each week. So they wait, right? They don't like to wait, so they wait and watch them all at one time. I mean, we lose our minds when it comes to waiting. Now, I like to think of myself as a pretty laid back guy. Waiting doesn't bother me, unless you talk to my family. And then they will tell you the ways that I don't like to wait. One of those is restaurants. Working for Chick-fil-A absolutely ruined me from being able to wait. I see everything, I critique everything, like you do not want to go eat with me at a restaurant. If I don't say something, it is really just the power of the Holy Spirit controlling my tongue. It's the only reason, if you've ever been out to eat with me, that I don't say something, but I hate to wait at restaurants. The other one is driving, and it's your all's fault. <laughs> Moving to Texas has absolutely ruined me from ever being able to go back to the southeast where the speed limit is this crawling pace of like 55 miles an hour. Like I went back several months ago and I thought I was going to lose my mind. It felt like I was walking. I felt like I was driving so slow. So driving is one of those areas that I hate to wait. Now, but we would all agree with this statement, right? Waiting is just difficult. There's areas of our lives where that's more true than others, but for all of us, we could say in different areas of our lives, waiting is just a hard thing. And scripture is full of examples of people who struggled with waiting. Think about Abraham and Sarah as they struggled waiting through the pain of infertility and waiting for a promise of God to be fulfilled. We can move on and look at Joseph as he's waiting in isolation in a dark prison, waiting for wrongs to be made right. We could fast forward and we could look at the life of Moses. He's waiting in a wilderness, wondering if the mistakes that he has made and the consequences that he is facing, if there will ever be a new chapter for him. And he's waiting. David, waiting in uncertainty and fear as he's hiding from Saul, waiting for the opportunity to realize and live out the calling and purpose of his life. Here's the reality for us, is that on so many levels, each of us today came in here in a season of waiting. Some of you are waiting I see some of our seniors in high school that just graduated sitting over here, right? You guys are waiting for a new chapter to begin and you're excited about this, right? You're anticipating something incredible in the future, this new season, this new chapter of life. Others of you, you're waiting and you're looking at the future, but you're waiting with apprehension, a little bit of fear, uncertainty. What's going to happen? Will that relationship that is, that is just tense, right, and where there's dysfunction, will it ever be resolved? The health issues that I'm facing right now, right, will they get better this side of heaven, right? We're all in seasons of waiting. Some of you came in here wondering, waiting, wondering about a career, a promotion, 
the security of a job, right? We come in here in seasons of waiting. Some of us, the waiting that we're experiencing right now is we're in a season of waiting where we look at the world around us, our culture, our society, we turn on the news and it causes us to be angry, it causes us to be afraid, because the world that we see is not the world we once knew, and we wonder if it's ever going to change. And so we wait. Waiting is something universally we all experience. Now, in our text this morning, we're going to be in Acts in chapter 17. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. But as we go there, let me remind you of where we've been. Paul has just left Thessalonica. He's had to flee, right? Repeated pattern here in Paul's life, right? Goes into a town and at some point, many times, he has to escape just barely with his life. And so he leaves Thessalonica. He goes to Berea and the same thing happens. He has to leave Berea because the same people are stirring up trouble and riots and mob mentality. They want him run out of town. And so some of the believers in Berea escort Paul out of town and get him to Athens. And that's where we're going to pick up on Paul's life. But the way Luke introduces this time in Athens is that Paul is in a season of waiting. And so here's the question that I want us to consider today as we read this text and we unpack it just a little bit. How do we remain effective ambassadors of the gospel when we're in seasons of waiting. In other words, how do we live out our faith? How are we effective for Christ in this world when there's so much going on in us and around us, right, that causes us to struggle in these seasons of waiting? How do we still do it? I believe our text today is gonna help us. And so the first thing I want us to do this morning is I want us to follow, I want you to follow along as I read this passage of Paul's time in Athens. So Acts 17, I'm going to pick up in verse 16 and I'm going to finish the chapter. So let's just read this account. Now, while Paul was waiting for them, that is Silas and Timothy, they didn't get to accompany him. And so while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Now, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and they brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. And we wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there, they'd spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Now what therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and the imagination of man. 
the time of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he is fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some of them mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed. Among those were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. Would you pray with me? God, this morning as we unpack this passage of scripture, God, would you open our eyes to see the truth of your word? God, would your Holy Spirit apply it to our lives that we may leave here different because of the power of your word working in our hearts and our lives. So speak to us, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, a couple of things that I want you to see here as we make our way through this scripture. The first thing is that it's so important for us to understand that there are two important factors to consider as we read and examine this text. The first one is the culture of Athens. Now, if you know much about Athens, about Greek history, right, you would know Greek mythology, the plethora of deities that we worship. We even see it talked about in Paul's speech to the Areopagus, where he's like, listen, guys, as I was walking up here to speak to you, I looked around, and you've got a God for everything, right? You've got statues to everything that could possibly be worshipped. You've even got a statue that says, in case we missed one, right, we're just going to have this one sitting right here that says, here's to the God that maybe we don't know about yet, right? So very religious, but very unsure is the culture of Athens. Paul has stepped into this culture. That's important to remember, right? Some of the terms that you just, just to be aware so you don't get kind of bogged down in the details, but so that you know just three terms that you might not understand. Two of them are are philosophies, the Epicureans and the Stoics, right? Just quickly what they believed, and this helps us kind of understand the culture of the day in Athens. The Epicureans, they believed that pleasure and happiness were the ultimate end. In other words, if it feels good, do it. Does that sound familiar? We got quite a few Epicureans in our day, don't we? But then there was another group. He says the Stoics. What did they believe? They followed a philosophy that said virtue, wisdom, goodness towards every living thing is what enabled an individual to reach a perfect union with the universe or with the gods. That was their belief. So those two beliefs are prevalent in Athens during this day. And then there's this group called the Areopagus. Who are they? Well, they are a group of leaders who would meet in a location northwest of the city of Athens on this this place. This place they met was the Areopagus. And then their name as a group was the Areopagus. Okay, And so they would meet there on this stone mountain covered in seats. And they were kind of like a ruling council in Athens. They would hold trials, they would debate, they would, they would discuss important matters, they would philosophize, right? They would settle disputes, and then they would even judge certain cases, particularly in the areas of philosophy and religion, and that's why they brought Paul in. He was preaching something different than they had heard, especially this resurrection of Jesus, so that's why they bring him before them in this text, is they want to hear more to decide whether it's okay for Paul to be teaching this this strange new thing that they are not that aware of. And so, just some terms, but those terms even help you understand the culture that we're dealing with in Athens. But there's another really important factor going on here, and that's the life of Paul. Think about everything we've learned to this point about Paul and what's going on in his life. Physically, his body has been broken and battered, right? He's battled health issues constantly, right? He's been beaten, stoned. Emotionally, 
You've, you know he's wrestling with failures and, and doubts, right? He's isolated, right? His friends aren't even with him. He's alone in Athens. He's probably confused, wondering what is God doing in, in, this, in this crazy thing that he's called him to. And so emotionally, Paul is struggling, and even spiritually. If I think about and try to put myself in Paul's shoes, battling discouragement, right? Battling discouragement as he is just constantly battling spiritual warfare. Every time he goes into a new place and presents the gospel, he sees God move, but then he's constantly under attack and having to flee for his life. So two things that are so important for us to understand. The culture that Paul has stepped into in Athens, but just the life of Paul as he steps into it. And and can't we relate to that, church? As followers of Jesus, can you relate to that? That there are cares and there are burdens and there are things that you carry in your own personal life that can sometimes hinder you from living out who God has called you to be. But then also the culture of the day is another obstacle and is another roadblock that sometimes just seems to weigh us down. I think as we read this text, we are gonna understand that the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit that strengthened and equipped Paul to be able to lift his head above the culture, above his own circumstances, so that he could see what God had called him to do and be able to persevere is the same Holy Spirit that will empower us to be able to do the same thing in the world that we live in today. So, by looking at what Paul saw, how he felt, and then what he said and did, I think we're gonna get some good tools that we can use, some great principles for us to apply to our lives. So the first thing I want us to look at is that while Paul was waiting in Athens, let's look at what he saw. What did Paul see? What does the text tell us that he saw? It says, while he was waiting, it says he saw that the city was full of idols. Now, that phrase actually means a city that was enslaved to idols. They they, they were, I think that is a great narrative, that is a great commentary even on our culture today, right? We live in a culture that is enslaved to idols. There are so many things that we worship just like the city that Paul entered into. And it says Paul saw it. He saw that this city was full of idols. Now. You couldn't blame Paul if when he got to Athens, he just buried his head in the sand and said, you know, my life has been hard. I'm here alone. There's so much going on. There's so many factors. There's so many circumstances that I'm dealing with personally. I'm just going to close my eyes to the people around me. I'm just going to hunker down. I'm just going to try to survive this. But that's not at all what Paul did. Paul chose instead to not be consumed with his own circumstances, but to look up and look at the world around him. Now, I want you to hear me say something clearly. I am not saying that our circumstances and our situations should be ignored or avoided or run from. The gospel of Jesus does not call us to live in denial of how our broken world affects us personally. It does not. In fact, the gospel does the opposite. The gospel brings hope and healing and perspective to our present realities. And at the same time, it gives us the power to rise above them and live on mission for Jesus while we deal with our own things. In the gospel, incredible that it's able to help us with both of those things. And that's what it's doing in Paul. Paul is able to see the realities around him. Church, do you see the realities of the world around you? Or do you, some of us would probably say, maybe there's some of us here today who would say, no, I just try to ignore them. Right, I just try to live my life and ignore the world around me and the brokenness of it. Others would say, oh no, I see it. I really see it, right, and I hate it. So let me ask you a better question. Not only do you see the world around you, 
but do you see it the way Jesus sees it? Do you see the brokenness around you the way that our Savior sees it? With compassion, grieving over the brokenness that sin has caused. Do we see things clearly? Paul saw the situation around him, a city full of idols, but he didn't just see it. This same verse also tells us how Paul felt about what he saw. It says that his spirit was provoked within him. Now, it's important to understand what this word provoke means. It means to be irritated. It means to be angered, and it even means to be stimulated to action. Right, so, so here's what Paul did, right? If he had had social media, I'm sure looking at this city full of idols, what Paul would have done would have been to grab out his smartphone and start tweeting, right? Just start blasting the culture of the day, like cursing the darkness, right? Hey, here's my post. Everybody share it if you agree, right? Let's just totally bash this culture and this wickedness, right? That's what Paul did when his spirit was provoked within him. It's not what he did, is it? As we continue reading the text, yes, Paul was angered as a Jew, as a Jew of Jews in this polytheistic culture, he would have been like a fish out of water, seeing these people worshiping all these different gods, and he would have said, oh my goodness, this is so wrong, this is so wicked. Right, the, the, and all of the, the pagan rituals and all the living for pleasure and self, he would have, everything about it would have just just angered him, grieved him, made him uncomfortable. For some of us today, we would say that's how we feel about the world around us. So let me ask you a question. When the culture around you provokes the spirit within you, how do you respond? How do you respond to those feelings? As a follower of Jesus, it's right and it's good for us to feel things about the culture around us, to be broken over it, even to be angered by it, to be grieved by it, to be provoked to even action. But what kind of action? What do you do with those feelings? What we see in the rest of this text is what Paul said and what Paul did based on what he saw and what he felt. So here's what I wanna to submit to you this morning, is that when we see things the way Jesus sees them, and then when we will bring our feelings about those things that we see into submission to the Holy Spirit and allow him to guide us and direct our feelings, then we are able to respond, to say and to do things that bring him glory and things that will lift up the name of Jesus and, and, be, and present the gospel in a way for our world to hear it. And that's exactly what we see Paul do. Look at this next verse. It says that he reasoned in the synagogue and the marketplace. Now, if you were here last week, Pastor Jason spent some time talking about what that means because Paul did the same thing when he was in Thessalonica, reasoning with them. And we understand that. But as we walk through these verses, what I want you to understand is that because Paul saw things the right way and he brought his feelings about what he saw into submission to the Holy Spirit and let him guide him, Paul was able to respond with the right tone and the right bravery. Paul didn't back down, he didn't compromise, he didn't say, okay guys, what you're doing is okay. No, he stood for the truth. But as we read, even his, his, his sermon, his speech, his address to the Areopagus, he did it in a way that caused people to lean in to hear the message and not in a way that pushed them away. Church, I think there's wisdom in that that we see from Paul that we can apply to our lives that when we see and feel things in a way that honors the Lord and we bring both of those things into submission to the Holy Spirit, then as a follower of Jesus, we're able to confront the culture and the world around us in a way that is advantageous to the gospel. And isn't that what we're called to do? So in his time, in the synagogue, in the marketplace. It says every day, 
He reasoned, he talked to them about the resurrection, about the hope of Jesus. Now, our time's not gonna allow us to be able to dig in to to this entire sermon. I would love to, right? But if, if I spent time unpacking Paul's sermon before the Areopagus, you know, we would be in Acts for years, right? If we took that amount of time going through this passage. So what I'm gonna be able to do this morning is look at it from, from just a high level. Look at this sermon as a whole and show you just three movements in what Paul is saying to the Areopagus that I believe is gonna be really helpful for us to answer that question of how we live as ambassadors for the gospel, even during seasons of waiting as we live in this world. Paul focuses in three areas. Now, and I was struck by this as I was, as I was studying. Paul's gonna preach And he is going to share the gospel with these lost men of the Areopagus, these Athenian pagan worshiping men. The truth he shares, yes, is for them to understand who Jesus is. But something I realized, Paul is also preaching these same truths to himself. Because the very thing the culture of Athens needed to hear in order for them to understand who Jesus was and is, it's the very thing Paul needed to be reminded of so that he could even rise above his circumstances and live in this culture and still be effective for the gospel. He needed it too. It was for both. Remember I told you there's two things going on, the culture of the day and the circumstances in Paul's life. Paul's sermon addresses both of those. The answer, the application is the same for both. So I want us to look at this quickly here for just a minute because here's the deal. Our circumstances can confuse us. Our culture can confuse us. But I don't know if you're aware, we have a resident theologian on our staff by the name of Worthless John. You might know him as Gary Cook. Now, before you get mad at me, right, and, and, uh, and say, that's how mean of you to call him Worthless John. He came up with that name himself back in another life when he was a top 40 DJ, okay? So, that's just, but the theologian, Worthless John, says this about what Paul is dealing with here. He says that what our culture confuses, the gospel clarifies, I love that. I wish I'd come up with it, right? But what the culture, even our circumstances confuse, the gospel clarifies. And so Paul's sermon is bringing clarity to his own life and to these people around him who want to understand what this is he's saying. And so in verses 24 through 26, Paul says, listen, you need to understand the person of God. And he goes through and he talks about who God is. And we don't have time to unpack it, but but he says he's the creator. It says he's Lord. He says he's self-sufficient. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need anything. He does not need to be served by human hands. It says that God, the person of God, he is the life giver. He is sovereign. Now, why does that matter? The person of God gives us confidence and it gives us perspective. These Athenians needed to understand how different the one true holy God was and is from all of their deities. But church, we need to be reminded of the person of God because so many times we live like God is not in control. We live like we are in a world that is out of control, right? And then we get to the place where we feel like there's no hope and and everything is just causing us to be afraid and and to hunker down and just hope to get through it. The person of God gives us confidence to live and it gives us perspective as we live. We need to be reminded of the person of God. But in his message, Paul also says, not only do you need to understand the person of God, you need to understand the plan of God. And so in verses 27 through 29, he lets them know, listen, God's desire, God's plan was for you to draw near to him. He wanted to reveal himself to you, to mankind. 
He did that in the person of Jesus. And why did he do it? Because he wanted to be personal with his creation, with those, with humanity who was made in his image. He wanted a relationship with you. And so the word became flesh and dwelt among us so that we could know who God is. That was God's plan. That's what all of scripture is is unpacking for us is the plan of God was to draw near to sinful humanity. And the only way to do it was through Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. Amen? But that's the plan of God. Well, what does the plan of God help us be reminded of for those of us who's placed our faith and trust in Jesus? Church, be reminded that the gospel, this plan of God, gives you comfort. And it gives you assurance. God is not far off. God has not left you. Right? We're not deist. We don't believe that there is this powerful God who created everything and then wound it up and left us alone. That is not the God of the Bible. That is not the God that we worship. The God that we worship, his plan was to draw near, to deal with our sin. That gives us comfort. That gives us assurance to live in a broken world. All we have to do is be reminded of the cross. The cross is not just something we think about when we think about dealing with heaven or hell and, 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 and salvation. No, the cross reminds us of every day the truth that the extravagant love of God sent his son to the cross so that he could draw near. There's so much comfort there for us. There's so much assurance there for you and I. But then Paul concludes his message by talking about the invitation of God. And it was simply this, to repent and to believe in Christ. Now he focuses on the resurrection. Why did he do that? Because without the resurrection, we have no gospel, right? It was not disputed whether Jesus died or not. That fact was, was known that, that there was this man, Jesus, who lived on this earth and he was this great teacher and he did all these signs and miracles, but then he was nailed to a cross. Listen, our hope comes from the resurrection, that Jesus came out of that grave and that he is alive. So Paul says, listen, there is a time coming. God wants to draw near, but you can choose to resist him. But you need to be aware at some point in time, you are going to be accountable for your sin if you do not let the blood of Jesus Christ atone for your sin. And so you need to repent and you need to believe in a resurrected Christ. That is the invitation of a holy, loving God for all of humanity. That's the invitation that Paul was presenting even to these rulers and leaders of Athens who were listening to him on the hill that day. Church, this invitation of God to repent, to believe in the resurrection, it gives us hope. That in every season of waiting that we find ourselves in, it will ultimately come to an end. When our bridegroom, King Jesus, returns and we will be with him forever in our heavenly home. Church family, you may have been in church your whole life. Isn't it good to be reminded of the person of God, of the plan of God, and the invitation of God? Doesn't that help you be able to put everything around you in perspective and to lift your head above it and not be defeated by it, but be able to thrive even in the midst of it in a way that makes you an ambassador for the gospel and to live on mission for Jesus? I wanna submit to you, that's how Paul was able to do it. How could Paul have been able to continue to press on without constantly being reminded of these truths that he shared this day on this hill in Athens? So we've gotta bring it to a close. 
And in these last verses of the passage, right, if we were to look at these, we would say, man, Paul's time in Athens was a failure. Luke tells us that most of the Areopagus mocked him and they rejected his message. He was even dismissed by the council, right? Some would say that them them saying, we will hear you again on this matter, was just kind of their pious, looking down, condescending tone toward Paul, like, okay, get out of here. Oh, yeah, maybe we'll hear you again one day. I don't know. But But they shut him down, I do know that. And it's clear because Paul leaves Athens that he was not welcome, that these leaders were not going to license his teaching and allow him to continue to teach without consequences. So Paul had to move on. Luke names two people in the text who who placed their faith in Jesus, Dionysius and a lady named Demarius. It says there are a few others, but we don't get the sense that there is this big movement, right, where many, many people respond to the gospel. And so we could look at this time and say, man, this season of waiting for Paul in Athens, he has to leave, he has to move on, and he has to move on alone, trusting that Timothy and Silas will, will rejoin him at some point on, his, on, a, on a future stop. So can you just imagine, even though Paul is preaching the gospel to himself and he's trying to remain faithful, he's probably discouraged, right? He probably has doubts, wondering, even Paul could have at some point said, is it worth it, right? Did I miss something? Right? The circumstances are just too heavy in my own life. Right? The response I'm getting, maybe I've missed something. Maybe I need to regroup. Maybe I need to think about this and, and do something different. Right? Paul leaving Athens, I imagine he is incredibly discouraged and defeated. But here's what Paul didn't know. Is that his speech before the Areopagus would go down as one of the greatest speeches ever given in Athens. There would be countless books written about Paul's sermon to the Areopagus. A few hundred years after Paul left Athens, there would be a church meeting in the Parthenon. 19 centuries later, when Greece finally became a sovereign nation again, this group that rejected and mocked Paul for preaching the resurrection, do you know that even to this day, on the Areopagus, by, on a flagpole, the flag of Greece is lowered to half staff on Good Friday. And guess what happens on Easter? They raise it back up. This people who mocked the resurrection, Now, even as a country, they remember it and they celebrate the resurrection. Paul didn't know any of that. Church, can I remind you, your circumstances, this season of life that you're in, it may feel overwhelming, but you don't know what God is doing in the midst of it. You don't know how God is going to use things that seem insignificant and difficult right now for his glory. You don't know the impact your life will make just by your faithfulness, even when your faithfulness doesn't seem to be making a difference. Right? We can't look at the results around us in order to decide whether we're going to be effective ambassadors for Christ. No, we have to look to Christ. We have to preach the gospel to ourselves. And be reminded that our sovereign, holy God has a plan to draw near. And we've got to remind people to repent and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to be reminded of that ourselves. So as our praise team comes this morning, I want us to close by thinking about What do we do? What do we do with this message? Child of God, I hope this morning that Paul's message to the Areopagus, that he was preaching to them and to himself, will help you have perspective 
and purpose and allow you to access the power of the Holy Spirit that's available to you in every season of life, in every season of waiting, so that you can have kingdom impact on the world around you. Can I just tell you today, based on the authority of God's word, not my own, the gospel reminds us that our discouragements don't have to distract us. Our disappointments don't have to deter us from living on mission for Jesus. And even our doubts about what may be going on in the world around us, they don't have to defeat us. The gospel has an answer to all of those if we will renew our minds and our hearts with it on a daily basis. So maybe this morning, in just a minute as we sing, maybe child of God, you just need to pause right there in your seat or maybe at this altar and you need to preach the gospel to yourself. You need to bring your discouragement. You need to bring your doubts. You maybe need to bring your disappointments and just lay them at the feet of Jesus and say, I don't know what you're doing in this season of my life, Lord, but I know enough to know I can trust you because of who you are, because of what you're doing, because of what is available to me in Christ. I can trust you even with these things that I don't understand. So God, would you give me the strength to lay these at your feet and to, would you be the lifter of my head and allow me to continue to live a life of purpose that glorifies the one who gave his life for me. Maybe you're here this morning and you're like Dionysius or Demarius. And the invitation for you this morning is repent and believe. You need to respond to that invitation and place your faith in the person of God to understand the plan of God and to respond to the invitation of God to become a follower of Jesus to realize that the only hope that we have is found in the gospel from the God who drew near so that we could know him. I don't know how God is dealing with you today, but I know his spirit is moving. He's faithful to use his word to encourage, to convict, to equip us However God is moving today, after I pray and as we begin to sing, I invite you to respond. We'll have counselors down front. We'll have ministers down here who would love to pray with you if that would be helpful. But let's be faithful to respond this morning. Lord Jesus, would you take your word? Would you use it this morning? Thank you for who you are. God, help us to see things clearly. Help us to feel the right way about things and help us to respond in a way that lifts high the name of Jesus. God, would you take your word and use it, we pray in Jesus' name. Would you stand?